Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week, uh, someone I've wanted to have on the show for a while, we've been talking back and forth, Thaddeus Russell, author of A Renegade History of the United States, founder of Renegade University, and as far as I can tell, kind of a, a troublemaker and a roustabout. Is, is that a fair description? Oh, no, I'm a perfect citizen, Matt. You're, you're just perfect. Yeah, I don't, I don't like to, I like to follow rules and I think that uh, society needs them and uh, norms, especially like moral norms, I think should be upheld. So no, I, I try to play it pretty straight. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was going to, I was considering a career uh, as a Boy Scout leader, but that, you know, that has some bad connotations to it. I was going to be a priest, but that does too. So basically I just decided to be a great American my whole life um, and just follow Follow what the leaders tell me. I think that's wise, don't you? Yeah, I, I think so. And and let's uh, for people that don't know who you are, why don't why don't we upset people <laughs> right out of the gate? Let's do that. And uh, talk about your 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 general theory about the history of the United States. Um, you know, forget the founding fathers. It was all about um, street criminals and and hookers, right? Um, well, it was about both. It was about the interplay between both. Uh, so my thesis is that that um, in American history, there have been groups of people not organized, acting spontaneously. For the most part, there was some organization who were people considered to be the low lives, the lowest people on the social order, the scumbags, the dirt of society who actually by simply doing things they weren't supposed to do by violating social norms, by violating the rules, by breaking the rules, they created sort of spaces of freedom that we all now occupy and take for granted. So for instance, the big example I use is prostitutes in the 19th century were very powerful, uh, very wealthy. They were the wealthiest women who were independent of men in our society. And they used a lot of that wealth to invest in real estate, like brothels and other real estate too, um, and use their, they use their wealth for political power. And they also were the first women to walk in public alone without a male chaperone and without being shamed for it, because they were already shamed. Uh, and they were the first women to color their hair, to wear makeup, as I said, to earn high wages, to own property. Uh, there were a lot of madam, madams, brothel owners, who acted as their own lawyers, so they were the first female lawyers in this country. They did a lot of stuff that looks like feminism and is not counted as feminism. And they're, of course, not counted as feminists. In fact, feminists were their enemies, and they were the ones who led the campaign called the Social Purity Campaign of the late 19th and early 20th centuries to lock up all the brothels and to put those women on the streets. And that's where they've been ever since, living in danger and terrible conditions and at the mercy of cops and pimps. So that's actually a great uh, success of the feminist movement of the early 20th century was putting those women on the street. So that's one example. Um, it's, the, it's the interplay between what I call the renegades, the people who violate the norms, who live according to their own pleasures and desires, and the moral guardians of our society, like the suffragists and the feminists, and the founding fathers, for that matter, who were no fans of, of loose and promiscuous women right after the revolution, in fact, the American Revolution, the founding fathers weren't directly involved in this, but their sort of their uh, descendants were politically. They had founded a bunch of w asylums for women who were either prostitutes or were just sexually promiscuous or who simply didn't want to be mothers and wives. And actually in those asylums, which in which they were locked, sorry, um, the uh, they were taught how to be mothers and wives, how to cook and clean and take care of children. Uh, it was an attempt to domesticate these women. So. That's, in a nutshell, um, the theme of the book, the argument of the book. I apply to various other groups. I talk about slaves, about unassimilated immigrants, about the mafia during Prohibition, who, of course, broke the rules and sold us alcohol, and they basically destroyed Prohibition by being the, the front-line army, selling, selling this illicit substance. That is renegade history of the United States. That's the argument. You know, that it, it reminds me a lot of... Uh... I mean, I'm, I'm a former Tea Party organizer, and I'm I'm right. still a community organizer of sorts. And so yeah. I, I had spent a lot of time studying the um, the grassroots movement, the spirit of 76, that I never viewed as a top-down intellectual movement. It was always a bottom-up, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, troublemakers in the streets um, mm -hmm. that had enough discipline to do that sort of direct action stuff that was the Boston Tea Party, where where nobody got nobody got killed. 
which would have norm normally been the, the 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 system, but but the the ethos of America, and, and maybe it's the way that we all came over here from wherever we came from, but it it was very much uh, uh, beautiful chaos. It wasn't it wasn't centrally planned in any way, um, even though there was a sort of a few values that really held us all together. Yeah. So the first chapter of my book is about, I guess, that world you're describing, which is sort of the revolutionary era in the United States. And it was funky, man. It was chaotic and funky. And uh, as you said, largely unregulated. Um, so it wasn't just prostitutes who were unregulated. Now, prostitution was illegal, but that law was largely unenforced. Um, but lots, lots of society's formal rules were unenforced. So one of the things that people don't understand is that during the revolutionary era, there was actually quite a bit of integra racial integration going on. And this, of course, is when there was slavery in the United States. Um, but if you went into a lower class, a typical lower class saloon, which were ubiquitous across America, you probably would have found blacks and whites hanging out together, drinking together, dancing together. And in particular, the Irish and, and blacks were very close during this period. They co-invented tap dancing. They co-invented a lot of American slang. A lot of American English was created by those people, by African-Americans and lower class Irish and, and lower class immigrants, created a lot of what you and I now say um, in our common vernacular. So um, that, that time before and during the revolution uh, is a great time in American history because there was so much freedom in the streets and you can actually see it and you see the founding fathers complaining about it. You see John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson talking about walking down the streets of Philadelphia or New York and being appalled by what they're seeing, which was people doing what they wanted to do. Now, some of it wasn't so nice. I mean, some of it was selling sex. Some of it was being drunk on the streets. Some of it was dancing, you know, wildly at some at some saloon or something. Um, but you did see a lot of this kind of libertine freedom. And I know that libertarians have, some libertarians have a problem with the libertine and some don't. And that's kind of, I think, one interesting split among libertarians, right? They're sort of the pro-libertine or the ones who are at least tolerant of the libertine and those who are very hostile to it and don't want to see anything like that. But, but yes, that period in early American history is a time of immense, I call personal individual freedom, which you might also call libertine freedom. Didn't didn't Sam Adams have a particularly beef with with British soldiers because they 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 partied all the time and, and didn't show the, the proper moral uh, behavior? I don't know. He might have. It would certainly make sense. Yes. Yeah. They, to a man, uh, every one of the Sam Adams was actually one of the less puritanical ones. But to a man, every founding father, this is really important, publicly, publicly was right. completely puritanical. Now, privately, there were a bunch, you know, they drank like most Americans, which was like fish during that time. Americans drank just incredible amounts of alcohol during that time. Um, but publicly, every one of them towed the Puritan line. Um, they were staunchly opposed to drinking public in public and their public statements. They were all about discipline and order and efficiency um, and being a good citizen and merging. This is the most important thing, merging one's identity, one's individual identity with the new emergent nation state of America, right? So you are no longer mad and I'm no longer sad. We are now Americans, right? So the beginning of nas American nationalism. Um, now, this didn't always comport with their private lives. You know, they were having sex with slaves and they were drinking like fish and they were probably fornicating in all sorts of ways they weren't supposed to be. Um, but what they said to Americans was, look, here's the deal. If we're going to be a democracy, even a limited democracy, right, the people who get the vote can't be doing these things. You know, you've got to, this is when sort of people un started to understand what democracy really meant. It means discipline. It, it means more responsibility than it does rights, it turns out, right? Because if, if the people govern, which is the definition of democracy, well, you can't have the governors be a bunch of drunks fornicating in the streets, right? And so that's what the founding fathers said. And they also said, and this is really interesting, they said that democracy not only requires that kind of intense self-discipline, it actually creates it in people. Because what you're doing, what the founding fathers were doing was saying, okay, we're going to take away sovereignty from the crown and we're going to give it to you, or at least some of you. What a gift. Wow, this thing. You now own and control and manage this country. Wow. And a lot of people got excited by that and they disciplined themselves, right? And so 
it's a it's part of classical liberalism too. Classical liberalism teaches right that we are self sovereign, but that requires intense self regulation, right? This was what John Locke's whole argument was, right? And the founding fathers took that up. So you know, I'm all for right the government staying off of us and and in the classical liberal sense, leaving us to our own devices. But there's a lot of moralizing that goes on in the classical liberal tradition, which I think. Is not stupid, and it's not because they're just uptight. I think that it's actually the logic of both democracy and classical liberalism is that we we have to moralize against ourselves all the time, against our own bodily desires, which creates this very uncomfortable tension in a lot of Americans. Right? We want to yeah. be good. We want to be good, but boy, do we love watching TV and we love drinking whiskey and we love do, watching porn. <laughs> so and all sorts of stuff. Right? I mean, and that's really true. I mean, it's there's a really stark like immense gulf actually between sort of American popular culture and what we do with our leisure time and what we say and how we behave in public and what we say in schools and in our workplaces and in the military and on TV and then when we run for office, right? We're all sort of good upstanding American Puritans when we're in public, but my God, I mean, Pornhub just announced that 160, there's 160 million views just from the United States every single day on their website. So, I mean, and that's just porn, right? I mean, you look at the rest of pop culture, it's a wash in hedonistic pleasures, right? Well, so they, that, they, they quarantined us in, in our houses for what's it been, six months now? What did they think was going to happen? You know, I mean, the, um, the, the, the sort of energy... <laughs> the chaotic anarchic and not not a good way energy in the streets right now has to have a lot to do with that i mean oh, it has yeah. to do with it yeah. a lot of a lot of, of pent-up uh, frustration that that goes back uh you know you know i'm i wanted to get to an article you wrote in reason and i'm i'm hearing your your theory and i'm, I'm wondering what you think about this i've never even thought about it this way before sure. but but i've always thought of america's founding as as, as very bottom up and you had you had the, the founders who were willing to embrace a radical idea that individuals could be sovereign and and you didn't need um, some some royalty, someone that's smarter and and more um, um, generous than yourself to dictate that to you from the top down. Very radical, very democratic idea. You know, Thomas Jefferson was a radical Democrat. And I would I would argue that the spirit of 76 was very much that that beautiful chaos of of the people in the street demanding that 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 sovereign um, ownership of their own bodies and minds, but the the puritanical part, um, as America moves forward, kind of gets weaponized, and it and it goes from a virtue that that you are responsible for pursuing into we need legislation to make sure that you don't drink, we need legislation to make sure you don't do do this that and the other. And and where I want to go with this is is an article that I thought you wrote recently, but it turns out you wrote it in 2017, um, in Reason magazine. Don't like militarized police and mass incarceration. Blame progressivism. And I wonder if I wonder if there is a line mm -hmm. starting with this 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 puritism, this this arrogance that you think you could tell someone else how to live your life and sort of weaponize it, mm -hmm. impose it at the force of a gun, that has created all of these 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 pathologies that, that we're seeing today? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And the quick answer is yes. <laughs> like, so so we are uh, well known for our many, many laws, not just prohibition over the centuries now, um, banning, proscribing certain behaviors that are victimless, right? Um, people have felt license since the revolution to lock women up for having too much sex, and then in the 20th century to lock people up for doing for taking opium, and then in the 1920s for drinking alcohol, and then marijuana, and then the rest. Yeah, it goes on and on. Pornography has been censored. You know, um, yeah, I think, and I, I often just sort of, I don't have. I mean, the only answer I can offer is our Puritan heritage. You know, for this, I mean, people. Thank God it's only it's always been sort of a small class of people, right? I mean, there aren't that many kind of puritanical scolds running around, but there's plenty. There's enough. Um, people who feel like it's it's their not just their right, but their obligation to make sure that you don't do something bad tonight. And that I think comes from 
Christianity, basically, not just pure Puritanism, but the evangelical strain in Christianity. I mean, I think it comes from the Gospel of Matthew when he says, go out and convert all others um, into believers, and which is also co often called the Great Commission by evangelicals, you know, and, and we've been an evangelical and puritanical country since the beginning, which is a hell of a combination, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, Islam is quite puritanical, uh, Judaism can be quite puritanical, but they tend to not be evangelical, right? So they tend to tend to want to stay by themselves. But Christians, many Christians, in particular American Christians, have always had this incredible impulse, which is nearly unique among people. I don't know exactly why Americans have had it so powerfully, but we have, or Americans have, to go all around the world and make everyone look like us. <laughs> it's, an inter it's an interesting uh, divide because I would have instinctually drawn a slightly different distinction between, you know, and and I'll go back to classical liberalism and Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments and and Hayek when he talks about the the natural evolution of social institutions, and I, I guess he would include marriage. I don't remember if he does, but I, I'm guessing that he does. But but social institutions that kind of hold everything together that emerge spontaneously because people are trying to figure stuff out, versus sort of the the scientism and the fatal conceit and and the you know the that sort of arrogant, some people are smarter than others attitude that progressivism had. Um, do you buy that, or do you think that's a wrong configuration? Um, meaning Smith versus the progressives, Me, yeah. meaning Smithian conception. Um, I mean, I'm I'm certainly more on his side in this. Yes, of course. I mean, progressivism. I'm. I, there's nothing about progressivism I have anything good to say about. I mean, to me, to me progressivism is is imperialism. It's the same thing as imperialism. Um, there's no meaningful distinction between the two. Progressivism begins with the idea in America that we must uplift the poor in the ghettos in the United States. We must go there. We must go into the ghettos, into the Lower East Side, and teach these Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants how to speak proper English. And we must teach the women and the men that the nuclear family is the only proper way to raise children, to get rid of the aunts and uncles who are living in the tenement with them. We must teach the men, you know, proper work habits and the women proper domestic habits and the children how to be good Americans, right? Uh, it was, and then they said, so that was beginning in the 1880s with all the immigrants. So it was this imperialist controlling mission domestically. By the 1890s, they said, wait a minute, it's not just, we don't just have poor people in the United States. There's poor people all over, all over the world who are living degraded lives and they have debauched cultures. Hence, 1898 and Spanish-American War and the invasion of Cuba and the Philippines and Guam and then the colonization of the Philippines and then putting schools in the Philippines where, you know, staffed by American teachers who taught all the Filipinos to be Americans. Um, and so the, that has been, yes, I mean, in the 20th century and the late 19th century, that's always been sort of at odds with a more classical liberal or libertarian tradition of letting, letting individuals and markets decide these things, you know, I mean, and that, that is the other part of the book I'm working on. So I look at the book I'm working on now, sort of history of America in the world. It's both sort of foreign policy and it's how American popular culture has infiltrated other societies. And then by doing so sort of dissolved authoritarianism within those societies. Uh, so if we just let the market go and not, not have sort of government led military interventions, I'll tell you exactly what's been happening for about 100 years now, which is in Berlin in the 1930s and the 1920s with the rise of Adolf Hitler, during the time of the rise of the Nazis, you know, it was way more, more uh, popular inside Germany than Adolf Hitler and, and the Nazis was jazz. Like Germans loved jazz, they loved uh, Hollywood movies, they loved Tarzan. They were all into that stuff. They, they loved, it was the, Berlin was the gay capital of the world at that time. So they had drag shows. I mean, it was sort of like renegade. It was renegade, the renegade world. And a lot of that was driven by American pop culture. And we could talk about um, the hundreds of movie palaces in China in the 1930s and 40s uh, that were showing American movies, but the nationalists and the communists didn't like that. So those ended up getting shut down. We could talk about it in the 1950s and 60s. I have a chapter in my last book, Renegade History, on, I mean, how jazz, rock and roll, blue jeans, James Dean, uh, Elvis Presley, 
ultimately disco just infiltrated every nook and corner, every nook and cranny of youth culture in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe and took that regime down from within over, over a decades long process. Um, that's what's been going on. We don't have to do anything, in other words, to take down radical Islam. We just let those satellite dishes on the on the roofs of every apartment building in Tehran keep beaming in our TV shows and our movies, right? You know, the mullahs in Iran and around the Middle East are issuing fatwas almost every day and have been for decades against American pop culture because they know that a T-shirt or blue jeans or a piercing is not just a T-shirt or a blue. It, it, it represents the expression of individual desire against the collective, which in that case would be Sharia law, right? Yeah, Following yeah. Sharia law. So it's the worst thing for a single woman to watch, um, can, uh, can, you know, Housewives of Beverly Hills or watch a Kim Kardashian movie or video or something like that. That's why they're terrified of it. So that's all we have to do. Let Adam Smith and his market go <laughs> and, and keep the progressive imperialist do-gooder controllers out of there. Yeah, well, including our own, because uh, I feel like uh, um, bombing, bombing a village with a drone sort of uh, undermines the, the spread of American pop culture, I'm guessing. That's exactly a perfect point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So in Germany, right, what happens is you have in the 1930s, you have just this explosion of American pop culture, which Hitler hated, and he banned all of it. And he banned imports from America immediately when he took power. But, you know, people still kept listening to it and still kept aping American ways, American pop culture ways. Um, but it couldn't be stopped. I mean, it was just, you know, it continued, that impulse continued all the way through the war and out of the war. And by by and in, in Eastern Germany, you had the same kind of renegade activity there. So you have like youth in, in East Berlin who are fighting the Nazis while wearing American like zoot suits. And then the next minute they're fighting the communists in the same place while wearing American zoot suits. Yeah. Yeah. You know, part of that history, we we you know, we've done a lot of work on on the history of, of socialism in practice. I'm I'm pretty anxious about the fact that the young people that are starting to think that socialism is cool again. And that pattern that you described with Hitler plays out again and again and again. You know, Castro banned the Beatles and you could go to jail for owning a Beatles album. The right. Soviet Union, I, I actually went through one of the lists of all the albums that you couldn't listen to in the Soviet Union. And it almost cataloged my entire record collection as as a young American kid. And in in Yugoslavia, Tito, the first thing he did when he took over, he he went after the poets and the artists and the and the free right. thinkers. And I and I think you put your finger on it. It's because they That's were right. independent. That's right. In fact, I didn't actually finish answering your your excellent question about um, U.S military interventions um, actually retarding that process of pop culture getting in and doing the good work. Um, yeah, that, that's what happens, exactly. So when you declare war on another country, you often end up blockading that country, right? That's what happened with Germany. So my point about Germany was, it was more full of renegades than the United States was when Hitler took over. I mean, Berlin was famous for, you know, it's gay, as I said, it's gay nightclubs and it's jazz clubs. And like, you had whole generations of jazz musicians moving to Germany permanently because it was even more friendly to them there than it was here, right? So, um, but what happened was the allies established a blockade around Germany uh, early on. And that was what they wanted to do even before, you know, even before Kristallnacht. So what that meant was that it was very difficult to send anything into Germany, and it was also very difficult to get anything out of Germany, namely, you know, Jewish refugees, right? But it could, it was became more difficult to, to get the stuff in and to, to leave people out. So yes, interven intervention has that unfortunate blowback for the very people it's intended to help. So I want to I want to get into your your theory about the the roots of mass incarceration and progressivism. Yeah. It seems like a particularly relevant thing to talk about right now, but I feel like we should have you sort of empty out your closet a little bit because I I read your bio before we did this and and <laughs> uh, you you grew up in in Berkeley as a as a Marxist. You were radical before it was cool. I did. I was born a Trotskyist. Yeah, <laughs> my parents were members of a revolutionary socialist organization in Berkeley in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was at that point, when I was born, it was they were members of the Young People Socialist League, and then they became members of the International Socialists. If you've, if you've been, 
if you've been on a college campus in the last like 20 years, you've probably seen their descendants. They're known as the International Socialist Organization or ISO. They're kind of like small but loud minority on a lot of college campuses. That's my parents' crew. Um, so yeah, I was I was raised around sort of Marxist talk and socialist. I didn't know what it meant, right? But my mission when I went to college was to figure out what socialism was because I because I had to be one. <laughs> um, and I was, I did that and I went to college and I read Marx and I read all the great socialists and I read the Russian re history of the Russian revolution. And that's when I was like, wait a minute, this is not looking so good to me. And Trotsky, I read Trotsky finally when I was in grad school. And I remember calling my mother up on the phone and saying, yeah, mom, um, what I read here is a mass murderer. I don't know, like, what are you doing here? I mean, there's nothing good in here for me. Uh, and she's kind of like, well, yeah, some eggs had to be broken to make the omelet. <laughs> Uh, or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I, um, I, it took me until my sort of mid thirties when I was fully enmeshed in the New York left and the academic left at Columbia as a grad student. I just, it just, it, it made less and less sense to me. And also the social, really the socialists, the people were awful. I mean, you think libertarians have a bad rap in terms of personality? I mean, socialists are like libertarians, but mean. They're like, they have the same issues with like social awkwardness, but they're like mean as hell, right? Um, and also- and, and they're puritanical in their own way, right? Super puritanical and hate popular culture. And like, I mean, I think that's a little bit different now with the very young sort of faux communists in Brooklyn, the hipster communists, but like until very recently, and I know from experience because I hung out with them, yeah. They didn't even, they never watched TV. They didn't know who Madonna was. They never went to the movies. They didn't listen to music. They I mean, except for classical music. It was all about reading and, you know, think, theorizing and doing good, doing good, just like a good Christian. I mean, it's a Christian, socialism and Christianity, you know, to me are, are kind of just the same, same impulse, same moral structure. Uh, just one has God and the other doesn't. Yeah. The, the, the thing about, um, uh, modern socialism, but I, I don't know where to draw that line. Uh, definitely, that this reconfiguration of democratic socialism, um, they they skip over. So Marx, of course, has this arc of predetermined history, and you know, before you get from late stage capitalism to this beautiful world of communism, where everybody loves each other and hugs are free, and nobody nobody wants for healthcare or food, there's this thing called the dictatorship of the proletariat where even Marx himself and, and Engels and all those guys are like, we're gonna have to kill a lot of people to knock them out of their old habits of owning property and wanting to work and, and wanting to provide for their families. And, and we've sort of forgotten that piece or, or we've erased that piece from the theory, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, that's sure. They don't, the modern left simply doesn't, well, it's funny, they do acknowledge it sometimes. They. They only acknowledge it in fits of rage. You know, it's when they see uh, some new billionaire build his new McMansion. It's almost always aesthetic, by the way, because, you know, American socialism is an upper class phenomenon, like entirely. <laughs> Let's be really clear. It's, you know, middle and upper class people almost entirely um, who are resentful of those who have more money than they have, um, namely the rich. So. You know, when you see, you know, some some extravagant display of wealth, then you'll see like socialists come out with, God, we should kill them. <laughs> Where are the guillotines? You know, it's time. But, you know, if you ask them in a, some public debate, some formal setting, you know, in an academic, at a university, right? No, there's no need for that. And I've been I've been told that because I, when I have I have socialists on my show, on my podcast, and I'll say this, I'll say, look, I like you. We're friends. It's going well. But I just need to know, like, after the revolution, you know, you're going to be shooting at me, right? Because I'm not going to go to your meetings. You understand that, right? I'm not going to work in your factories. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to work where the collective tells me to work. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to, you guys get this. I'm lazy. I say this to my socialist friends, like, I'm not going to work. What are you going to do to the people like me who won't work? And they're like, oh, it's fine. You don't have to work. I say, yes, I do have to work if socialism is going to work. Everybody has to work if the thing is going to work. And they so they just sort of punt on the whole question. Um, but I wanted to say this about um, the sort of refusal to acknowledge what making the sausage really looks like on their part. I have been struck 
ever since I came into contact with libertarians um, about how absolutely, I think it's willful ignorance, I don't know, but they actually don't understand. I mean, people on the left, they actually don't understand the violence that's implicated in the state and what this, and the state relies on violence. Um, its possession of the monopoly on violence, its application of violence, its threat of violence, the whole thing falls apart without it. And regardless of what kind of state it is and what, regardless of what they want to carry out. I mean, I've had, I've said this to people, you know, on the left, like, you know, if I get a parking ticket, or they'll say, they'll say, well, what if you get a parking ticket? You just pay the fine. It's no big deal. I say, yeah, what if I don't pay the parking ticket? They'll say, well, then you get just another notice and you get, you know, I say, yeah, what if I never pay any of those parking tickets, any of those notices? You know what happens? I become Corinne Gaines, who was the black woman in, in uh, near you, I think, in D.C. or in Maryland, who did exactly that. She had a bunch of traffic tickets and she just didn't pay them, didn't pay them, didn't pay them. And finally, there was a warrant and they sent the SWAT team to her house. And she was sitting at her kitchen table with a shotgun. And when the SWAT guy came to her front door with a rifle and pointed it at her, she pointed the shotgun at him and she was killed. And if she hadn't done that, she would have been taken to prison, to a cage. So over parking, over, you know, traffic violations. So yeah, there's always violence there. But the left, you know, I think if, if any intervention needs to be made with the left, it's that. They need to be forced to deal with, with the, some of them understand it and they sort of just say, yeah, like the hardcore communists will be like, yeah, 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 we got to kill a bunch of people. We get it. But most people on the sort of soft left who are like, you know, bourgeois, upper, you know, educated, went to Yale, uh, et cetera, they don't get it. They don't get that it's about killing and, and caging people and, 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 and stopping them from moving, you know, stopping migration of people also. It's violence through and through the state. What? Yeah, there, I, I see that that cognitive dissonance where you're they're they're currently marching uh, in the street, um, progressive socialists. So there's a bunch of different people marching for a lot of different reasons, but um, they they seem to have righteous anger against the abuse of the monopoly power of police mm -hmm. in the murder of George Floyd, and. They seem to be just as angry about that as we libertarians have been angry about abuse of government power and and the killing of innocent people since as long as we've been libertarians. Um, but they don't they don't go past that and say, but I still want to ban everybody but the cops from owning a gun. But see, here's the thing, Matt. They actually they're not clearly angry about. How'd you put it? Government abuse of power? They're not. They're interested in the racial distribution, the, e the e equal racial distribution of pain. <laughs> they want they want pain to be equally distributed among the races. They want, I, it seems, because they're very uninterested in actual structural reform. They absolutely refuse to acknowledge the fact that there are 500,000 white people in prison right now. They absolutely refuse to acknowledge that white people, more white people get shot, unarmed white people get shot by cops every year than blacks. Yes, it's disproportionately black people who are affected, but I mean, if it's a racist agenda, that's a hell of a lot of collateral damage. I mean, the thousands and thousands and millions of white people whose lives have been literally destroyed, or at least mostly destroyed over the last 30 years, 40 years of the, of the drug war and the war on crime, I mean, that's a lot of damage to take for the racists, right? It's like, we're gonna, well, what, what racists would say, well, we're gonna have like, we're gonna kill and incarcerate like millions of our people just to get at the blacks. No, it's it's about the state wanting order. And by the way, you know, anybody who knows this topic at all well, knows that the major calls, the most consistent, loudest calls for the war on drugs, for the mandatory minimums in the 60s and 70s came from where? It came from the black. It came from the black political class, not black people. Black political leaders and clergy were calling loudly for very tough laws against drugs and crime in the 60s and 70s. Michael Javon Fortner, sociologist at CUNY, has written a book on this. Um, so the whole thing, I mean, there's just so much that is not understood by the people in the streets, and the the thing that really bothers me. To me, the whole problem with it is the relentless, incessant racialization of it. Uh, when we could get the families and friends of some of those 500,000 white people to join in a coalition with Black Lives Matter 
to end the use of chokeholds, to stop sending military equipment to the police, to take their tanks away, to take their body armor away, to take their rifles away, to change the rules of conduct and engagement in police departments all across the country. And in fact, we kind of are. I mean, Minneapolis is doing that, right? And that's kind of good. But um, so maybe this is that moment. But for a long time there after Ferguson, you know, there was a moment right after Ferguson when a lot of conservatives and right wingers, uh, not just libertarians, were saying, hey, the cops need to be reined in. And it was an exciting moment where we could actually bring together like someone like DeRay Mackison with someone like Mitch McConnell and actually have some real reform, right? And actually demilitarize the police, defang the police. But Black Lives Matter and the entire left just wanted to make about race, 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 race. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so much about let's get the number 2.3 million down to a, a better number. I never heard that. It was just, it's disproportionate. You know, it's just racially disproportionate. So I always thought, well, if you had, if you added more white people to San Quentin, is that going to make you happy? Um, yeah. So I, it's, it needs to be a state analysis, a state analysis rather than a race analysis here. Yeah. And yeah. in class, yeah. in class, in class too, very much class, very much a class analysis. And and the way I've been saying it, um, if we want to talk about systemic racism, we need to talk about the system that enforces through the monopoly power of the state, yeah. policies that have racially disproportionate outcomes, like yeah. the drug war, like everything you just mentioned. Yeah. And and let's let's segue to this, because I think you probably wrote this article. I thought this was a new article because it it seems so modern given the, the state of things today, which I guess is a tragedy because you wrote it in 2017 and things have only gotten worse, not better. But talk about the history of, of progressivism and and you know we we've dipped into a lot of these theories already in this in this short conversation, but but how we got militarized police police and mass incarceration in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, well, the war on drugs actually begins in the 1900s with Teddy Roosevelt um, and the food what was it called the Pure Food Act I think in 1906. Yeah. Um, so that was the first law against basically prescription drugs at that time, and a lot of those were opiates. Um, so until then, drugs were basically uh, all legal in this country. And um, so that was a progressive move. Teddy Roosevelt, very famous progressive. Um, and then prohibition, you know, was the next move by the progressives. Again, people don't know this. Pro prohibition was a progressive cause completely, right? So that was, that was the war on drugs. And then in the 1930s, Harry Anslinger and the Roosevelt administration, they, they launched the reefer madness war on marijuana also progressives. <laughs> and then in the 1960s, we have uh, Lyndon Johnson um, and his crime bill of 1965, which uh, also was part of this uh, very progressive administration. Um, and then, of course, Bill Clinton, 1994, you know, and well, Reagan is part of it. True. That's true. Um, some incarceration did go up, but the big spikes the first spike is after Johnson in the 60s, and the big, big spike, as everyone knows, is in the 90s with Clinton and the 94 crime law. So here's the deal, you know, like for centuries, um, you tell a whole group of people in this country, black people, that they don't really belong, they're not really Americans, they don't belong here, they don't get the vote, they don't get the right, they were slaves for a while, they were completely left out. So what do you think they're gonna do? How, what's their attitude about American norms and rules gonna be, do you think? You know, I mean, some of them have been like, yes, sir, Uncle Sam, but most people generally, most African-American or a lot of African-Americans in this country have at least been skeptical <laughs> toward American, you know, morals, right? And so, of course, when you have a black market, when you make a very popular substance like drugs illegal, who do you think is going to fill that market? It's going to be the people who care the least about, you know, being good Americans. Well, black people. So that's what happened. And that's why they've been disproportionately brutalized, is the word, by the war on drugs. Um, the FBI has estimated that roughly half of all current prisoners in state and federal prisons are there for a drug-related offense. Not necessarily a drug-related offense, but, you know, like, if you're poor and have a, a meth habit, what are you going to do? You're like, you're going to have to rob somebody, right? Um, and that's very common. So a lot of people are in prison for drugs. So about half of the mass incarceration issue, the FBI and I and others believe, is about the war on drugs. So if we made all drugs legal tomorrow, decriminalized all of them, which I'm for, we're going to lose a huge chunk 
of our prison population. And we're going to reduce a lot of the deaths in the street from cops as well, because a lot of those a lot of those killings of people were about drugs, too. Um, you know, all the gangs in this country, they didn't start um, they didn't form themselves to just do violence. They formed themselves, I think, without exception, every single major gang in this country who are responsible for most of the murders, by the way, they formed themselves as drunk, drug gangs, drug running gangs. Uh, and they're, they're successful and powerful and wealthy because drugs are illegal. And they're full of really, really bad, violent people because drugs are illegal and only really bad, violent people occupy a black market, not good, upstanding businessmen. This is all very simple. You and I and many others have known this for decades. Um, and America is slowly coming to this to this realization. But if you simply ended the war on drugs, meaning decriminalized all drugs, including, including powder, man, African-Americans would have much better lives. So it's, it's interesting that um, a lot of Republicans are coming around to this. And I, I would definitely add Richard Nixon into your uh, hall of shame there. But but Absolutely. he, of course, is every bit as progressive as as anyone else you named. So I'm, he was I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, but but not nearly as cool about it as the other guys. That's right. Super, super awkward about it. But <laughs> but I mean, this and this this I guess we should be hopeful about this because there are a growing number of it's almost a generational thing where we're younger Democrats, far left progressives, uh, AOC and her her colleagues. Um, they're all for uh, pretty radical drug legalization. I don't know if they go as far as, as libertarians would go, but there seems to be a generational shift in that conversation, which is which is walking away from those progressive authoritarian, um, puritanical, uh, you need to live a certain way and I'm going to tell you how to do it kind of roots. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, so what do we do with the fact that they want to legalize drugs? I mean, I think it's I mean, I'm glad, you know, we support them. Uh, I support them in that. But at the same time, they want to make most of us into federal employees, right? Through, yeah. the, green, the, the, through the Green New Deal, they want, they want, they mean, government, working for the government is super cool. Um, which, by the way, like every hipster, like, you know, every hipster lefty I, needs to be asked that question. Like, since when do you think that a government job is cool, right? Like working for, and by the way, this government, you want to work for this federal government or even your state, like how many people, even on the left, like love their state government, right? Like what do people think about their state, local and federal governments? Even when it's their people, it's almost a gripe, right? It's almost always the main thing is a gripe, yet they're clamoring for those people to be their goddamn employers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to That's... wear a uniform, I guess, like to have a flag on you. These people wanna have a, you think it's not gonna be American flag on your shoulder, buddy? Like hipster in Brooklyn? What do you think they're gonna do to you? Like, and do you think the military will have no interest in this whole new project of everybody being working, every, every, everybody working for the government? You think the military won't enjoy this at all and see like a lot of easy recruits from this? Come on. I mean, talk about a retrograde policy initiative and conservative and nationalist and reactionary and as anti-left and as I can imagine, employing much of the population by the government, what could be worse? Yeah. It's, it's also, well, as we know, what was very, very popular among many governments in the 1930s here and in Europe. Yeah. yeah. So. Speaking, speaking of retrograde, uh, Joe Biden, uh, you didn't you didn't mention him in the Hall of Shame of of people that that have incarcerated uh, uh, so many black Americans. Um, but I, I watched that video. It's, you know, all the all the Trump guys are sharing this video of Joe Biden on the Senate floor bragging about how many more people he was going to put in jail. Uh -huh. And and those same hipsters that apparently want to wear government uniforms when they go to work, <laughs> they now have to vote for Joe Biden. Well, some of them. I mean, that's I, not there fair. Are, there are some there are some good principled leftists out there who are who have the same take on Biden as that you and I do. Um, I mean, I did mention the 94 crime bill. Of course, he basically wrote that and was its chief proponent. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Is there a is there an American politician active now in the United States who's more responsible for mass incarceration? I don't think so. Um, I don't, right? I don't. I think he's the number. I think he's the champion. There's also that video of him uh, bragging <laughs> to a group of Democrats that he he voted for building 700 miles of fence, which is, you know, if you've seen the fence, much of it is a wall. Um, <laughs> Joe Biden, you know, was a big fan of the Iraq war. He was a big fan of the Afghanistan war, big fan of the drone war, uh, <laughs> big fan of the Patriot Act. <laughs> I, uh, so 
on immigration, on incarcerating people, on killing black bodies and caging them, on killing brown bodies in the Middle East. Um, it's like um, all of the, remember all of the fever dream paranoid fantasies about Trump in 2016 about what he would do to black people and brown people and Muslims? Joe Biden's already been doing it. He's been doing it for decades. <laughs> It's like he is he has done more damage to brown and black lives and bodies than Trump could ever dream of. I mean, there's no way they're going to deport as many people as Obama and Biden did. They can't. It's almost physically impossible. <laughs> um, I don't think he's going to build 700 walls of fence of, of wall, 700, 700 miles of wall. I don't I don't think he's going to invade two more countries <laughs> you know, in his brain might, but I doubt it. Uh, you know, I don't think he's going to kill half a million or a million or however many people died in you know, the Middle East. Uh, he might, but I doubt it. Yeah, this is this guy is as he's more Trump than Trump. It's staggering that this is the Democratic candidate nominee. And what will the Democratic Party do if it doesn't split apart? If the Democratic Party doesn't split apart, I just it has to, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like inevitable. If that's going to be your your guy and half the party is AOC and Bernie, they're not going to tolerate that. And that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Well, well speaking of your, your criteria about making the entire national conversation today about race and, and racial equity instead yeah. of looking at the systemic abuse of power that, that kills both black, brown, and white people, um, one of the criteria for Joe Biden is apparently the, the de facto criteria is he has to choose a black woman yeah. um, as his VP candidate. And that that list gets pretty short and, and they may end up with Kamala Harris, who was a top cop in California who spent her entire career putting black kids in jail. Yeah, putting lots of people in jail. Threat and then she threatened parents who wouldn't send their kids to their to her public schools. Uh, I don't, she didn't actually do it, but she threatened to send to, to send parents to to prison uh, for, on truancy charges. Um, which is like, I, again, I like to tell people: people don't know. People don't know that public education that education is compulsory. Like they don't know that they just sent. Yeah, you know, it's like talk about sheep. They just send their kids to these schools, and they don't know that they're legally obligated to do that. So I like that Kamala Harris actually revealed that. You know, the inner work, what it really means. You know, yeah. like you, you can go to prison if you don't send your kid to school. Yes, I think it would be quite appropriate um, for him to pick Harris as his running mate, a black woman. So he's got that, and then a prosecutor. So I mean, that's, you know, you get a black face like Obama dropping bombs on people, a brown face like Obama dropping bombs on brown people. Uh, it's fine, apparently. I mean, the left, I, the left, that apparently is the left or liberal, liberal, we should say, liberal agenda is for brown people to be killing and incarcerating brown people. And that's what they, I mean, that's what Obama did. That's what Kamala Harris did. So, you know, that, that would make sense to me. Yeah, she's, um, she's a pretty vile human being. I, I'd say she and Biden, um, I can't think of any two politicians I dislike more. <laughs> So they so they fit together in a weird way. I think they're perfect. Yeah, God bless them. Go for it. And then you know, if they win, then I have at least four years to continue to hammer away at this, you know, stuff. And they're going to be so open to criticism. It'll be wonderful. It'll be a field day for that for us. No, I, I think you're probably going to the gulag. And and the the real answer that your socialist friend should have said is, well, we're going to outsource the violence to a third party and we're going to we're going to move you north to the gulag so we don't we don't have to deal with troublesome people like you. That's right. But that's not violence, it's different. Yeah, yeah that's different. That's justice. <laughs> so you are um, you know, you you have you have a pretty spotted history in terms of your education and and, and where you've taught as well and I suspect you may have opinions about about uh, the the new speech police and political correctness and I should start by saying I noticed that maybe it was today that your your most recent podcast with Hotep Jesus was demonetized by YouTube. Mm -hmm. What what did you guys say that was so offensive to the thought police at YouTube? Well, you, you're about to get this demonetized, I guess. I don't know. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they didn't they don't tell you, of course, right? Because the Stasi never tells you what crime you committed exactly. Um, <laughs> the um, I mean, we did a lot of cursing. There is that. Um, we talked about how we talked about how black liberals, not black people, but black liberals are essentially the puppets of white liberals um, that they get 
all the awards, all the professorships, you know, they get all the book contracts, they get on CNN whenever they want. And what they rely on uh, is, is the patronage of white liberals. We talked about that, that could have gotten us demonetized. We talked about black nationalism as being sort of a, I'm not a nationalist, I'm an anti-nationalist, but black nationalism, because it's never held power in this country, has actually served pretty useful purposes in in decoupling, we said in the, in the interview, decoupling a lot of black people's minds from white, from uh, obsessing with the white, the imagination of what might, their imagination of what white people think of them, which he and I identified as like a core problem in racial liberalism, is this paternalistic relationship where black people kind of depend on whites and they worry about whites, they, they're they obsessed with what white people think about them, we have, they're obsessed with white people's racism, their inner thoughts, right? Uh, we talked a lot about that. We talked about black people becoming independent and autonomous psychologically. You know, again, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the heads of YouTube, but um, it's frustrating. And we did, but we did, we did take on a lot of the uh, shibboleths of today, the racial sh shibboleths that are thrown around. I, I guess that's all we did. What can I yeah. say? So tell me about, um, I mean, all of us are sort of looking for alternatives where we can have civil, open, candid conversations, and that's pretty much your mission in life, uh, and maybe maybe to trigger people that that aren't used to candid conversations, but but you've you've launched something called Renegade University. What's what's the mission there? Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, it's that. Um, we are interested in providing an alternative to the traditional universities, the, the so-called normie universities. So what we teach is things that you just won't find at Harvard or Cal or Berkeley, um, things either that subjects that are not taught or subjects that are taught, but are taught in a different way, a radical way. So we welcome, we welcome anybody on the left or the right who simply is not allowed and whose discourse is not allowed in those universities. So, you know, we have a course on sex work, the politics and history of sex work, pretty important thing. You know, you're not going to find that at Dartmouth. Um, we have lots of courses on history and philosophy, but they're always taught from either a radical left or some radical right point of view. Uh, and we welcome mostly, as you said, a diversity of ideas. We love the conflict of ideas. We love debate, dialogue, discourse. My podcast is obviously sort of a, a temple to that. I've done 119 episodes with everybody from Mencius Moldbug, the neo-monarchist, to Marxists, you know, to all sorts of socialists, liberals, conservatives, lots of libertarians, everybody, and there's never been a fight on my podcast. We've had lots of in-depth in -depth discussions, but never a fight, hardly even an argument. Um, that's what Renegade University stands for. It stands for also two other things. It stands for rigor, academic rigor, and I think there's very little of that, actually, in most universities, and it stands for fun, because I've always found ideas and talking about them fun, and most of the members of Renegade University are very much like that. We love talking about this stuff, and we love watching watching the dialectic between two opposing ideas play out. That's what we love more than anything. And uh, the, I mean, is the podcast? I mean, it's obviously separate, but is it is it is it part of that curriculum in your mind? Uh, no, I mean, the podcast we just use. I mean, podcast is separate. It's. Um, there are some people who have been on the podcast who teach at Renegade University, um, but no, it's it's separate and it's going to we're going to actually make them more and more separate. We want to make RU less and less about me, but um, the podcast obviously brings in a big audience and that helps us, you know, advertise for RU and let people know about what's going on at RU. But yeah, we want to keep them separate. So what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? I I have this. Um a somewhat optimistic view that I haven't abandoned yet. I used to be quite romantic about, about the breakup of, of top-down institutions and the way that technology was democratizing knowledge and, and undercutting the authoritarians who might be in the newsroom or they might be in the White House, wherever they are. They used to have this tremendous power over us because there was a monopoly on information. And that, that whole thing is kind of turned um, from a beautiful discovery process into into kind of a shit show where everyone is tribal and they don't listen and they spend all of their time on Twitter not learning a damn thing but just hating on people that they think are different from them is there is there are we in the middle of, of a paradigm shift or is this headed towards uh, um, really bad stuff 
I mean, I might be still in my romantic phase about this too. I mean, I had, I've been preaching the, the imminent demise of the nation state for a while. Um, I think the, I think the nation state has begun. Uh, I, I think its end has begun. <laughs> I think, um, I, I just don't see how it's possible to, for the internet to exist, even if it's regulated, because it can't be really regulated. Um, and crypt and the rise of cryptocurrency and blockchain and open source software and cheap international flights, right? Uh, so like poor people can actually fly between countries for the first time in history because of deregulation. Regulation. Yep. Um, I just don't see, I mean, people are, I put it this way, people every day are leading their lives less and less according to the boundaries and dictates of the nation state, right? They're not doing it consciously, ever, you know, they're never thinking that, but they just are. I mean, they're talking to people all over the world. They're consuming information from all over the world. They're ordering products from all over the world. They might be shipping products all over the world. They're flying all over the world. They're seeing people from all over the world in person. There's just more travel, international travel, which is a huge thing. That's underestimated, by the way. Yeah, um, so at the same time, you're right. I mean, there is all this siloing going on, some of which I like, and some of which ends up being just stupid tribalism, as you're saying. Um, but tribalism, historically, has always lost out to markets. Tribalism has always been undercut, eroded by by markets and by by free movement of people. Right? I mean, that's that's what tribal chiefs have hated more than anything. Right? Is when modernity came in and like offered a road out, sometimes literally, <laughs> you know, um, or or just a book to read that takes people's minds to another place. You know, that's that's the anti-tribal antidote right there. So I, th I think that, you know, in the short term, God knows. God knows. I mean, we could have a mass shooting at one of these protests this summer. I, I would not be shocked. I mean, it could be that disgusting and horrible. But long term, yeah, I mean, I think it's good. I think that long term, the, d the nation states in trouble will, will slowly dissolve, it may not disappear, but it will dissolve and become less and less significant. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic long term. I'm, I'm, I'm clinging to that view. I mean, I, I keep telling my friends that we're in the middle of a, an extremely uncomfortable paradigm shift. And we're, we're, you know, one of the, you know, the George Floyd video, but thousands and thousands of videos before that and, and bloggers and, and Twitter queens were, were sort of uh, removing the emperor's clothes. Yes. And that that mythology that that our politicians were perfect and they didn't cheat on their wives and they always did what they said they were going to do. I mean, Americans were always a little bit skeptical, but when you can see that it's a lie again and again and again, it starts to break up the old order. But but we're trying to figure out how to be truly democratic now. And I use a small d democratic, maybe in the way that Jefferson would um, shifting power to the end user. Not about simple majoritarian democracy where 50 plus one percent of the people get to do whatever they want to the other people. Um, so I, I feel like we're we're sort of working it through, and it's going to require um, knowledge dissemination outside of our new social media overlords, uh, which is why I wanted to have you on. Um, we we got to wrap up, but I want to um, give you the mic to give me some closing comments and make sure you tell us where we can, where we can get your podcast and, and where we can sign up for renegade university. Yeah. Oh, well, so go to renegadeuniversity.com. Um, and when you become a member at any level, you can join what's called are you live, which is our new program. It's, it's the most fun thing I'm having doing right now, which is uh, once a week. In fact, uh, tomorrow night we'll be having Curtis Yarvin on Mitch's mold bug on, um, are you live? We have a guest on, and members of RU can attend. It's a Zoom meeting, and they can ask questions and participate with these very interesting people, and that's once a week. Um, go to renegadeuniversity.com, become a member at any level. The podcast is available everywhere. It's on YouTube now. It's now all video, so that's the, that's the new thing in the last couple of months. But it's also available on all podcatchers, all podcast apps, as an audio podcast as well. So go to the unregistered, unregistered YouTube channel to watch it, or just you can subscribe on your podcatcher. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out with me. And, and let's do this again sometime because I feel like there's probably a thousand other things to talk about. Oh, yeah, totally. Anytime, man. Would love to. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Matt. Bye. Thank you, sir.
Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.